Thank you so much, uh, my brother Mube, for such a welcome, and thank you, Brother Charles, uh, for, for, for the prayer. I want to greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, I was just thinking about it that COVID has just made us all common. You know, when they say that at the foot of the cross, we are the same, that's what COVID has done. It has just made us all common. I mean, COVID hits us, third wave when it comes, it does not differentiate which home it hits, the, the list, or it just comes and it's, it's, it's wave three, it's COVID wave three, you know, in different waves and different variants. But what differentiates us from COVID, my brothers and sisters, this is before I just start my story, it's how, it's how you and I relate with God. How we still remember that God is still in control. That's what differentiates you, a, 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 each person from COVID. So others will, COVID will hit them down and they won't even know what to do. But others will still stand up and smile. When they say in the vessel, we smile in the Lord, in the, in the Lord. Because in the, in, in the, with Jesus in the vessel, we can smile in the storm because we know of a God who's seated on a high throne. So I want to greet you all, my brothers and sisters, in the name of Jesus on this mission Monday. That is, we talk about mission. As we talk about mission, let's just for a while forget our problems. You know, like that woman, that young lady of, 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 of uh, Naaman, who forgot, but I'm, I'm a slave here, I'm treated badly, but I still have duty to do. So let's at once just put all this down and say, no makanjan, we are working in the vineyard. So this morning I decided to share my story. I just believe that sometimes when you talk about our own stories, Yes, you know, we can learn from, you know, from our stories. We can be inspired with our stories. So I'm going to share my story. My name is Valerie Mundwa, as most of you have heard. I am a Zimbabwean, and I grew up in a location called Mbare, for those that know it. Now, Mbare is a location that looks like your Soweto. So I grew up in a home where, where there was no prayer. There was no going to church. No one told anyone to go to church. My parents were there. My siblings were there. We just lived. A day would come a day would go. We would eat. Sometimes there was a struggle. Sometimes there was plenty, but there was no prayer. There was no prayer even before eating food. That's where I grew up. And as I grew up, the only close to God I could hear from in my house was my mother at some point would just say, ah, God will help us. That's where I'll just hear the word God. And I'm growing up. And also uh, my grandmother from my mother's side, whenever we visited, Whenever we visited my grandmother, my grandmother would, because, you know, I don't know if you know, way they would, it would, she would make you sleep on the floor, um, you know, as the, the, the grandchildren, when she's sleeping on the bed. And, and, then, and then early morning, you would hear my grandmother praying. My grandmother had 10 children. My mother was the third born. So my grandmother would start with the first born, who was my aunt called Anaki. My grandmother would start and say, oh, God, be with Anaki. And, and then when she gets to my aunt Anaki, the first one, she starts mentioning Anaki's children, my, my, my cousins. And then I always waited for my mother's turn, which was the third, because my mother is the third born, and I'm the third in my family. So I waited for my name to be mentioned. So I'll be, I'll be in those blankets, but hearing my grandmother saying the prayer. And when she gets to my name, I'll get excited. So she'll start with my mother's name, be with Egina and their children. And then she'll say, be with Emma, be with Edwin. And then she gets to my name, be with Valerie. And I'll get so excited. So that's how close I would hear prayer. So that's where I grew up. And it just so happened that where I grew up in this location, I had my friends who were going to a Catholic church with their father every Sunday with their parents, father and mother to the Catholic church. And I admired seeing them in those beautiful dresses on Sunday going to church. And I also wanted this, but it was not happening in my family. Then I decided to go to my parents and I asked, can I not also um, join them to go to church on Sundays? Uh, my parents were happy. They had nothing against church, by the way. And I want to thank God that while we did not pray, they also did not take us to the Sangomas. I thank God for that. We were not taken anywhere. We were just a family. I don't know. We were just living. So my parents were excited that I'm saying I want to go to church. They even bought me my beautiful Sunday dresses. So now I was joining my friends and would go to church. So it happened that now these friends became my friends now because we go to this Sunday church together and we play in the community together. So one day we are coming back from school. We're also going to the same school. I was in grade two, which is about eight years old. We are coming back from school. We are walking, going back home. And then this friend of mine said, no, today we are not, we are not going straight home. We are going through uh, the church. There is a, a service for young ch children at that Roman Catholic. So Mina, now I was taking myself as the church member now, even at my eight years old. I said, no, I'm coming with you. It's also my church. So we went. 
We went to that church and I found a brother in front of these young kids. So I think they were having a program for kids. And my, this brother was there and this brother was uh, making us repeat uh, the verse, that's John 14, verse one to three, that uh, let not your heart be troubled. You know, I want to say it in Shona somewhere and, and, and I'm saying this so that you understand that it still sticks in my head. And he just says, let, so the brother was lively, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you the part I like. And in my father's house are what? Are many mansions. If it's not so, I'll prepare a place. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and, and receive you to where I am that you may be also. Now in Shona, there's a part where in my father's ma, 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 ma house, I mean, he mentions, it was like, I mean, it's stuck, it's stuck in my mind from the 80, 80 years old. That's how, I, and, then, and then I got excited. I was like, who is this Jesus? Who is going to make mentions in heaven? I am coming from a four bedroom house where my mother and father have a bedroom. My sisters, we are in the spare bedroom. My brothers are sleeping in the lounge. Other visitors we have are sleeping in the kitchen. And I'm thinking, I want this person who can give me a mention. And you know, because my father was the first one to stay in town from the rural areas, many relatives that came from the rural areas were coming to our home so that they also can look for a job. So we were always many, even in the three sisters of mine in that spare bedroom, we had aunties, so the room was always packed. You know, when you are walking, waking up in the night to go relieve yourself, you have to jump people. So when I heard about this Jesus, who had gone to prepare a mission for me, my brothers and sisters, I got excited. I, I got really excited. To me, it was real. I was picturing myself with my own mansion, no more sleeping in the lounge, in the kitchen and all those stories. That's what God, and I want to tell you, my sister, the way I got excited, there is a hunger and thirst in me that grew that day, that I want this Jesus. I want this. So as I'm looking at you, I don't know how Jesus brought you. I don't know how Jesus called me. Jesus summoned me at the age of eight. I don't know if God knew that if I leave this one at the age of eight, I will never ever get here. I don't know. But a tracker was put inside me at the age of eight the hunger and thirst for this Jesus. Jesus might have used, God might have used a mansion because that was what would, you know, speak to me at that time. If maybe it says silver and gold, I don't know if I would have understood, but a mansion made sense coming from a pegged house where I was coming. So I got excited. So here I was, um, I find myself now looking, even as I'm now growing into my teenage years, remember that hunger which was put at eight years old still is there. That is saying, you need Jesus, you need Jesus. So now I know, in my mind, I knew that I can only get Jesus in churches, at a church. But because I'm coming from a home that does not know church, I started going, continuing going to the Roman Catholic until one day something happened, which I don't have time to share. And I said, no, I'm leaving this church. I, because even when I was there, I still felt no man. There is this, you know, something is, is not missing. So I started going from church to church and I find myself at a school where I was in a boarding school for girls and I was, I was down now doing my A-level. As I was doing my A-level, I was made the hostel head girl, the head girl of the hostel. You know, I talk too much, they think I'm a good leader. So they made me the hostel head girl. So while I was the hostel head girl, we, I, the, I found one girl in that hostel of girls um, at, at the school where we were boarders, who was an Adventist, her name was Cecilia. The rest of us were all over the place. I was in that search for change. So I would sometimes go to, to, to Pentecost out. I was just going anyway. So we were allowed to, to, to request from the matron to go to church every Sunday. Now this girl, this girl was Cecilia. She's the only one who went to church on Sabbath. And, and now it was my duty to take the book of requests to the, to the matron. So she would come to me and say, hey, Valerie, please, on a Friday evening, Val Valerie, please take the book to the matron to sign. I have to go to church tomorrow on Saturday. And I used to think this one, she wants to behave different. Yeah, is, she, is this a cult? What is this? And with my friends would laugh and say, why is Cecilia doing things different? We all go to church on Sunday. And my brothers and sisters, I want to be honest with you. There are times I would sit on that book and not take it to the metro. And when she comes back, I would say, the metro did not open a door. And Cecilia would not go back to, to, you would not go to church the following day because no approval was done. So I always say to my children, I feel like I persecuted Cecilia. You know, when Saul was persecuting, I felt like I persecuted Cecilia also because there are times she could not go to church because to me, it was like a cult. How can she be the only one going to church on Saturday? Little did I know, my brothers and sisters, that Matthew 7, 13 says, enter through the narrow gate 
for why is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction? And many enter through it. And I thought going to church on a Sunday when everyone is going is well. So I carried on with my search for church. I don't want to take time on this one. I carried on with my church for search, my, my search for church, but still I would go to this church, but two, two months later I would leave. I would go to this church. Three months later, I'm not happy. Some churches I would not even last two weeks. Something would just tell me you're in the wrong place. So it just happened. Remember the track I had put on me at the age of eight. God had said, you are mine at the age of eight. No matter, no makanjan, I will get you at the age of eight. So here I am now. I'm now a wife. I married. I don't, I don't go to church. But even those, uh, the family I was married into was also not going to church. But they knew that in me, there's this search of church that is happening. I made that clear. Whoever was around me would know. Even my husband, my late husband would know that, no, this woman is searching for a God. And my parents knew, everybody knew. So I carried on with this search for church. So when we moved, we bought a house in a certain suburb. As we were living there, the neighbor was an Adventist. So my neighbor, Mrs. Siwawa, and I moved when I was expecting a baby. So I got there in my early months. So the lady, the lady next door started taking care of me. She was also old enough to be my mother. Started taking care of me like a mother, you know, cooking for me, you know, things that a pregnant woman likes, doing all those things. And she did all the, you know, every morning she'd wake me up. I hey, did you wake up well? How are you? You know, how are you feeling? And I brought you this. This is good for someone who's pregnant. You know, all those things. She did all that. And I knew she's going to church on Saturday. She never invited me. She was just going to church, but she was playing this role of being a mother. So she, one day, one day she just says to me, ah, but what are you doing? Let's go back to church together, to the afternoon program, right? You know, we have morning and afternoon. Then I said, and at that time I was now heavily pregnant. I was like eight months, you know, in my pregnancy. Then I'm like, yeah, let me go. But in my mind, I was saying, hey, this cult again, that Cecilia's church. Now, how do I say no to this woman? She's been nice to me. She's been cooking for me. She's been like a mother. How can I say no? So in my mind, I'm saying, you know what? Let me just go once just to please it. But in my mind, this was not the church. To me, this is a cult. I mean, why do they do the things on a, on a day that others don't do it? Then I went with them. Hmm. I went with Mrs. De I remember as we drove at the gate, as we, I walked out. I don't want to lie to you, my brothers and sisters. I'm not being dramatic. Right from the time I got out of the car, it was like heaven is saying, Valerie. This is home. You know, it was like everything inside me is agreeing. It was like blood is pumping. It was like that hunger has just been closed. You know, as I walked, as I see people greeting me, as I see this woman saying, ah, this is my neighbor. This is my neighbor. And they're all coming with their smiles. I was like, you know, I felt like sound has been closed. I'm now communicating with something else where I'm just being shown, with it. this is home. This is home. As I went inside church, even going inside church, you could see the smile on my face. I'm sure even the lady, my neighbor, could not understand that this woman has just changed. Ah, I walked in, and it was you, the pastor, most of you know here in South Africa and Zimbabwe. Pastor Chekerwa was conducting a, 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 a two weeks effort. In fact, that Sabbath was the very last day of the effort, which I entered, right? So I entered there, and as Pastor Chekerwa was speaking, I just felt like, yo, this is the word. You know, he was speaking. I could, I had like the word is coming from somewhere else, not from him. I, it was, it just hit me. I remember there's a time I stood up without anyone asking me to stand up as he was preaching. It was like something is controlling my movements. I can't control it. There was so much excitement. I was like, yo, this is it in my heart. I'm like, this is it. This is what I searched for for years. This is it. And it was such excitement. And when he made a call, I was the first one. I remember I had to, you know, you know, in those pews where you don't have space enough to move, I had to jump people's feet and go in. I was in front and I'm smiling. I'm like, I'm here. I think my neighbor was surprised that I just invited this one. She was not even sure she wants to come. Here she is. It was like something says to me, Valerie, you are home. Now, I want to believe this that a tracker was planted in me at the age of eight. And there was this hunger and thirst for the Lord, hunger and thirst, which was there, and thirst for a, a, a family to fellowship with. Nothing could close it. But if my neighbor had not taken the initiative of playing the role of, of, of bringing me to church, of igniting the tracker, my brothers and sisters, I could have been a drug addict today. You know why? I'm telling you that thirst and hunger made me feel like there's something missing. 
make me feel like there's something missing. And I want to tell you, if it had not come, if I had not been brought to God, if someone had not played a part in playing a role of being a mother, cooking stuff for me, because it all starts there. You remember Jesus' method. Christ would mingle with the community, would mingle with people, would identify the needs of the people. This woman mingled with me, identified with, oh, she's pregnant, so she needs to be taken care of. That's why she did not rush. I'm going back to the story of yesterday. We need to be strategic, my brothers and sisters, when we are doing mission, we need to be strategic. And that's where it was. This woman took a time to think, how do I do it? And she brought me to church and that trekker was ignited. It was ignited inside me. The trekker put it eight years old. My brothers and sisters, as we sit here, are we not failing to ignite some trekkers in people where God has planted something and we are failing, my brothers and sisters, to ignite something in them? Because we are not doing that we are supposed to do. We are not giving a book to the person. We are not inviting the person to church. We are not, but and some people end up drug addicts and we don't understand because God has a way of planting something in us and it squares on and on. And God wants to co-work with you and I, who already maybe know him, to say, ignite something in these people. If that woman had not invited me to church, if that woman had not strategized, she later then told me that, you know what, I just said, if I say to you, come to church, you would just think I want to count you as a number. But I wanted to show you that God loves you. Hence, I took my time to look after you. And yo, I, must, I see time is moving. So things went on, but it did not end there. Then as I went to this church, I found a church that strategized. And I want to rush on this one, but I must say it. When I was now in this church, excited every Sabbath. I was there smiling every Sabbath. You know, they, I'm sure they didn't understand, but I knew, man, it has been years, since eight years, man, looking for this kind of a place, looking for this Jesus. But here I am observing the right day. Oh, so it was good. And in this church now, you know, a church that strategizes for mission. I don't know if your churches are still that doing that. I don't know you as a member, as I or you, wherever you are, you are still strategizing for mission. Then this family church asked around, who is this lady? Then they learned that my father is in hospital. His leg has just been amputated because my father was diabetic, right? Amo was dispatched. Amo said, okay, leave Mr. Mtamba to us. Amo was dispatched. Amo found out through me that my father, what does your dad like? My father loves reading newspapers every morning. He was in hospital for a long time. His leg had been amputated. Amo started pairing themselves up. My brothers and sisters, I would walk in church. I have tears in my eyes and see a roster. Mr. Mutamba written in the, in the vestry with the names of men, two, two every day that you have to go to the hospital at 6 a.m. at the very first visit and bring my father a, new, a newspaper and pray with him every morning. Two men, no, there was no fail. I'm going to strategize. And then the doctors and women's ministry says, no, leave Mrs. Mutamba to us. They went to my mother. They said, mama, we know you're always at the hospital waiting to see your husband. We are going to be sometimes assisting you with meals. They would cook meals and say, so that it, when you go home at night, you don't worry about cooking because you've been in the hospital. So imagine, Amo was with my father. Dokas Women's Miss was with my mother. They, br brothers and sisters, there is no way when we, work, when we give our all in mission, God will answer. God will co partner. When we do the best we can, God will come. I said, I came from a family that did not even pray for food. By the time my father came out of hospital, he says, I want to go and be baptized. And the guy, the Amo had done enough. When I say Amo, I'm talking about men in church. I don't know what else they are called. They had done enough with my father. The doctors were saying, we can't put this wound in water because you, you know it has to heal. My father said, find anything you can do, put plastics around it. I, want to, I don't want to die before I'm baptized. My father from hospital was taken to my church for baptism together with my mother. It was an emotional baptism of a man without one leg. There were six deacons in there. But my brothers and sisters, the joy I had, I had tears in my eyes. The joy I had to see my father, my father in that pool being baptized. But it all came because a woman, a woman, a neighbor decided to play a role, to work with God, co partner with God, and invited me to church. Then the ripple effect happens. My two siblings were baptized. Then a ripple effect happens. My other cousins were baptized. A ripple effect happens. Some neighbors of my mother were baptized. So I am saying, sometimes we think there's little in giving a book. We think there's little inviting one person, but God takes care of the ripple effect. There is a way the ripple effect happens. And for me, something that actually gives me joy the most, uh, my children, 
I told you I was married in, 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 in a non, kind of a non-Christian home. My children are going to be the first generation of Adventists in the Munwa family. And I thank God, that's why I kneel for them every day, that God may nothing take them away because I have seen a generation already coming up in the Munwa family. And I pray that when God bless them with their, with their families, they too will continue and, 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 and with this with knowing God. And I always say for my son, like Joshua would say, as for me and my family, we save the Lord. My brothers and sisters, let's do our part. We have no, we don't know what will, what will cause generations will start in families. And I will end with the story of one man. I know I've left some things because of time. I'll end with the story of one man. Uh, there's a man called uh, Mr. Finley, Mark fin Frank, fin Frank Finley in Tasmania, Australia. One day he went out to drive with, on a Sunday with his family to drive a car on a drive. As they were coming back, the wife, they were now on the, on the bridge called Tasmania Bridge. In 1975, it happened. The wife noticed that there's something wrong in front. And then the wife says, hey, honey, 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 stop the car. So when honey stopped the car, they realized that the bridge had collapsed, but they were already at just where it had happened. So the car was like hanging on a cliff and the car was like, you know, swaying on that cliff. So the man managed to maneuver out his family out of the car because if they had done it wrong, the family was going, the car was going to plunge there. But when, when, when Frank Finley took pre, pre, uh, his family out, he stood there and he thought to himself, do I just sit because my family is safe? Or I can stand on the road and wave something to tell people that the bridge has collapsed. Don't continue going, otherwise people will plunge to death. Of course, it was at night, there were not many cars, but he says about three or so cars ignored him and they plunged to death, but there are also those that they listened to him and they parked by the roadside. My brothers and sisters, that's what we should do. Like this man, we can't sit and rescue the perishing. We must stand up, my brothers and sisters, and wave and say, hey, you know, time is no more. The three angels message, Christ is at the door. This is the time you can give a book. We can do whatever you do. The ripple effect happens and it happens because of God. God will cause a ripple effect that you don't know. I believe one day, my brothers and sisters, from all the work you, you do, whatever you have done, one day God will take you to the band in heaven and say, these are here because brother Charles, this is what you did. Sister Lindy, uh, brother Mbinga, sister, uh, sister Kunene, it's brother Itu, the whole team there, because of that 5 a.m. prayer group, these are here in heaven. You are going to be shown us there that if you had not done that, people like Valerie, woman, we had ignited that faith. Uh, it was about to, to wear off. But because of the 5 a.m. prayer group, you did it again. My brothers and sisters, let's not tire. Let's continue doing the best we can. God will do the rest which you are not able to do. Mrs. Papu last week said, if you are carrying a handbag with no book, it's not worth carrying. If you are driving a car, it's not worth driving. And I'm saying, and I'll end with this, if you are living a life without sharing, without witnessing to a soul, without inviting someone, then that life is not worth living. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Amen, Sister Valerie. We, you, you have been blessed by your, your word, this sharing of the word this morning, that little is much when God is in it. Could you please pray for us before we go into our prayer rooms? Okay, let us pray. Let us pray. Our Father, our God who art in heaven, God of heaven and earth, we come to you this morning, thanking you for another time you've given unto us to remind each other that there is a God in heaven and a God who wants to save all his children, a God who's long suffering, a God who loves us all, a God who leaves the 99 in, after the one ship, a God who stands at the gate is the, us, the prodigal children are coming back and welcomes us. That's the God you are. But Father, make us understand the importance of this work, that we too have to actually sit down and strategize. We have to actually sit down and sacrifice. This woman sacrificed the Lord. She was buying me stuff in my pregnancy. I never gave her the money back. She sacrificed time, but she knew where she was going to. You were working with her. And Father, I pray that we you make us see eyes to see that we need also sacrifice. We need to strategize. We need to sit and be with you and pray for a soul and you give us the ideas to approach them. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers and thank you, Father, for even agreeing to be co-workers with us, sinners as we are. As we are about to go and pray, we invite your presence in all our rooms. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen